Hey, everyone. This amazing ESO Network show is brought to you by our fine sponsor, Amazon.com. Please remember to shop Amazon for all your geeky needs, no matter what time of the year it is. All you need to do is go to ESOPodcast.com slash ESO Amazon. Or click on the Amazon banner on the ESO Network webpage to go to our e-store. It's the best way to shop and the best way to support this program, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Okay, that's enough of me battling for now. Now on with your regular scheduled show. You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Time for the ESO Dragon Con Report, a podcast dedicated to help newcomers and veterans prepare for the upcoming annual convention in downtown Atlanta. With interviews, advice, and news from the pros and fans alike, be careful, you never know, you might actually learn something. Howdy, and welcome to the seventh episode of the 2017 Dragon Con Con Report. A little more than one month away until Dragon Con. See, they're, they're just stunned silence. I thought there was going to be screaming. Well, I, I don't know just... when. When are we <laughs> uploading this? Because it's the first now. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, uh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's it's less like than a month. 30th, so. it, it's less than a month. So right. um, if Matt. you're listening to this... It's 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 right behind you. Like it's, it's that close. It's close um, enough that everybody's debating. Hi, this is Eternal Zan. I'm just jumping in. It's close enough that everybody's posting their countdowns and then arguing about like what day are you counting down to? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, you already heard Eternal Zan. Uh, she's here on the station with us for I think the first time ever for the Dragon Con report. So welcome, Zan. Thank um, you. We've also got, of course, Director Mike Faber. Hey, everyone. I can't believe 30 <laughs> days. 30 days. Ah. He's just waking up from that knowledge. Like, uh, he's just. True, in, he's, true. Yeah. Actually, Judy, and, and Judy course, just brought me ice cream, so I'm just happy. Uh, uh, I that's see. Allowed. That's allowed. Well, see, we don't have ice cream for the whole crew. Snacks, I don't, what's snacks. up with that? Darren Noel, of course, is here. Hi, everybody. What's happening? And, of course, I'm your host, Mike Gordon. I'm I'm pleased to report this to you. This is a great show. This is a special show. Um, this is uh, in lieu. We've got, of course, our, 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 our folks here on the station, but we're going to go off the station for a little bit. Instead of our usual discussion and topics that we do every month, we're actually talking to some uh, folks behind the scenes of the big event. So we are talking to uh, the official uh, director of media relations, Dan Carroll, uh, our good friend, Dan Carroll. So it's always good to touch base with him right before the big event. Uh, and we're going to be talking to some track directors that we've never before spoken with. Uh, the, at the Urban Fantasy, the track director, uh, Carol Malcolm, joins us uh, a little bit after that. The High Fantasy track, the new track. Uh, of Dragon Con. High Fantasy track director Jennifer Liang will be joining us as well. And Skeptics track director Derek Colendano. I think that's his last name. And I, 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 I will find out later if, that, if I just butchered that or if I got it even halfway close. Mike, um, uh, Mike I'm totally skeptical about that last name. <laughs> well, you know. Um, here's the thing. For those people who have to wait till we do the um, uh, the the guest announcements to start drinking when we mispronounce names. Well, they got started. We got started early, <laughs> so uh, um, we're also going to speak with John Sean Patton from SMP Designs. He's going to give us a, a little bit of look of what it takes to to make some really. He's he's made some incredible designs uh, design work over the years for folks who have been cosplaying and costuming as at Dragon Con. So it's going to be great to talk to him about his process and how long he's been doing it and some of his great uh, efforts that he's made uh, for Dragon Con people. So a big pack show for you. So we're going to get right to it. This Earth Station One special report is sponsored by Amazon, where you can find all sorts of cool, geeky merchandise. If you're ordering some swag from Amazon, please help us out by going through our link. It's right at the top of our ESO website. It doesn't cost you any more, and it really does help us out. Uh, and if you'd like to leave feedback or comment on the show, please call our ESO feedback line, 404 404- 963-9057 or feel free to email us at esopodcast at 
at gmail.com. And we definitely want you to use the feedback line and the email address because the next episode, the, the, the last episode before the big event, the next episode that you hear is going to be all about what we want to hear from you guys, what you guys are looking forward to at DragonCon. Last year, we had uh, a ton of messages that people sent us. So we want you to send us voicemail. We want you to call our, our line to leave a voice message. I think we still even have, do we have that link still up, Mike, with uh, people can leave messages or is that gone? That is gone. That technology is okay. so last year. <laughs> of course. <laughs> So but people nice. can use their, their cell phones. It's as easy as that. You can either call our feedback line or you can just record a voice memo and email it to us. And we will play it on next week's show or next month's show. Um, and, and we want to hear from what you guys are excited about because uh, it's, it's almost upon us. And uh, we are very anxious to hear from you guys. So, um, But before we do that, let's get started with some news and notes. Not a lot of news as we head to the big event uh, with uh, less than a month to go. Um, but I did want to point out that for the first time ever, Dragon Con will now be selling, uh, I believe they're available now, Thursday only passes. So if you only want to go down Thursday or if you just want to hang out with people on Thursday, that's that's a big deal. I mean, there's so much happening now on Thursday uh, that now it has its own pass. You can get a day pass just for Thursday. So uh, check that out by going to the official link. Now, I did hear that if you already have a four-day pass, Thursday is covered in that. And that absolutely. was from somebody who worked for registration. So yes, you only need a Thursday pass if you're getting daily passes or you don't have a four-day pass and are not planning on getting one. Absolutely. That's, that's absolutely true. And also, uh, from what I hear, is programming doesn't start till late afternoon, early evening, anyway. So okay. we're actually getting programming officially Thursday. Yes. Yes. We, well, um, with uh, uh, last year, they moved wrestling, uh, DCW, to oh. Thursday night. So now okay. that's a Thursday night event, official Thursday night event. A lot of tracks now are now having uh, official panels starting there. Uh, okay. I, do, I believe uh, the classics track does a sing along that night. <laughs> um and uh there's all sorts of fun stuff but yes it is and i think it's comparably pr priced i don't think it's as much as a saturday pass so because it is only you won't be able to go into the dealer's room you won't be able to go into the uh artist alley or anything like that because those won't be open until friday also neither will the walk of fame Good yeah. point. Yes, the Walk of Fame will not be open on Thursday either. So if you want to, but if you want to see the wrestling or if you want to see some of the other acts or take part in some of the panels, you, you will have the option to, to get a Thursday pass. So yeah, I, I think what Thursday night has been known for up until fairly recently was the Thursday afternoon newbie tours that I'm sure Kevin has talked about on this podcast before. Those are Thursday from 2 to 5 p.m. And the Eternals party starts at eight o'clock on Thursday night. Woo! So other than that, you know, there really hasn't been a lot of official stuff. Those are the most, the two most <laughs> longstanding official things that mm -hmm. I can think of for Thursday. Well, th that being said, there's a lot of unofficial things going on, typically in the Marriott lobby. Thursday. Yes. Oh, big time. There's the and um, and you now need a pass to get in the hotel. And that's that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. So so if you're it's not participating clear. in Dragon Con, I think they're locking down the hotels Thursday clear. night. So which is great. Um, so because I do know even last year, I remember seeing some looky loos coming in on Thursday just to just to see what they could see uh, for free. You know, yeah, there was this um, really weird looky loo who was wearing this big tiki mask. You know, it was really strange. Uh, last year. God, <laughs> that guy. Wait. Just, just weird. to be clear, you think that you'll need e either a hotel key for the hotel you're trying to enter, or a Dragon Con badge to get into the hotel on Thursday? Yes. Not, not, in, not until, not until the afternoon. Yes. Not until the afternoon or evening. Yes. Uh, my guess is that uh, now this is not. Oh, this that's is just interesting. Guessing. I hadn't heard that. Mike, I would actually say Thursday night. Probably because you still have all the businesses that are still right there right. that people right. cut through the hotels and yeah. stuff to get to the parking garages, to get to Marta. So they 
yep. there's no way for them to enforce the badges until later in the evening. And I think that's, that's yeah, what I would have guessed. Be. They would have Plus, just been checking at the door of the events. Like normally when you go to a panel, they check at the door of the panel. That's what I would have guessed. Plus, you've got to get to your hotel and check in on Thursday. So if you don't have a pass to do that, you can't do that. So obviously, it's going to be much later. Um, so, mm -hmm. But I would imagine by the time things really start cooking Thursday night, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of the hotels just kind of locked it down. So, um, But uh, that's we'll find out because this is a new thing. So it'll be uh, interesting to see how that, they play that off. Um, I also do want to make people aware that there are still uh, a few left, a handful left of general admission and VIP passes for the Georgia Aquarium night. So if uh, anybody is interested in participating in that, uh, I would pull the trigger on that very quickly because uh, it doesn't look like uh, you will have um, much time uh, because they they sound like they're they're sold they're getting to be sold out, and that is Saturday night from seven to eleven. Uh, there's a costume contest. Uh, I believe there's uh, a DJ there. Um, the G Dragon Con Night at Georgia Aquarium is is quite the event. So if you do want to check it out, um, and that's only for like at that point, the Georgia Aquarium from seven to eleven will only be Dragon Con people. Um, it'll not be um, not the, the general public will not be allowed to to enter uh, the Georgia Aquarium for that event uh, at that time. So um, the con the costume contest I know is hosted by uh, Mr. Napoleon Dynamite himself, uh, John Hedder, and Michael Rosenbaum. So, so yeah, uh, And they did sell out in advance last year, and no tickets were sold at the door for either VIP or regular memberships. So I think that's really smart to pull the trigger now before they're yep. totally sold out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, also, want to make sure that everybody is aware that uh, this year um, the uh, official... Uh, for celebrity photographer group is uh, Epic Photo Ops. Um, they've already have a link now on uh, their Facebook page, on their website, on the Dragon Con site that is already taking orders for um, the celebrities this year. Now, um, so if you are interested in getting uh, celebrity photos, a photo op with a celebrity professionally done, um, then check that out and get those before they sell out because some of the big celebrities are only there for one or two days this year. So uh, if you do want to get, uh, say, um, William Shatner's um, uh, a photo with him, a photo up there, or with Nathan Fillion, who's only there Friday, um, you know, you better jump on that now because uh, and uh, Ming Na Wen also is only there on Saturday for photo ops. So if you want to take advantage uh, of those offers uh, and they're pretty, you know, I was looking at the list and, you know, of course, you know, this is not the time to argue about like whether or not they're worth this price. But I think the, most of all, most of them are pretty reasonable. And what's really fun is not only can you get the individual ones, but you also can get, uh, you know, the group shots, the group shots, the team up shots, whether it's with um, the Winona, uh, with the Winona Earp folks with the um uh the rain uh, uh trio that they've got there with john and carol barrowman which is always uh, a treat uh, every single one of those photos is a winner uh you can get a birds of prey team up because i believe all three actresses will be there um also guardians of the galaxy uh you can get uh i think uh my, both michael worker and, and uh, uh james gunn uh, will be there so um so yeah, that's uh, so. Do that. Uh, take a look at that and uh, lock down your photo op opportunities now. Um, and if if the uh, guest cancels, then uh, you should you will be getting a refund uh, in that in in case of that happens. Uh, they um, that yeah, that's the only that's one of the only ways that you'll get a refund is if the guest itself uh, or herself cancels. So um, just know that in advance. Um, okay, so last piece of news item um, is that we know that there's going to be a lot of programming that's moving around. Uh, we've already mentioned how uh, the fantasy tracks and uh, the alternate history tracks and some of the other tracks are moving around. Um, I did get confirmation just uh, right before we started recording that the comics and pop art panel room has moved to the Westin. It will not be in uh, the apparel mart. 
when they said that there will be no panels taking place in the apparel mart, they meant it. So even though the comics and pop art area is in the apparel mart uh, itself, it still will be there. I will have a table there. Uh, look for me at Tiki Zombie. And uh, but any of the panels that I'm on with, for the comic track will uh, will be in the Westin. Uh, I believe it's uh, it's going to be in the um, place where there was uh, Urban Fantasy last year. Urban Fantasy is still in the West End, but they've moved into another section of the West End, and then the comic panels will be uh, moved to where they were. So definitely, I think the, the bottom line is check, check, check. Don't assume that any of the panels are going to be where they were last year. Uh, I certainly think for most part, a lot of them will be, but there's a lot of panels and tracks that have moved around. We've tried to cover them all as much as we can with these, uh, with these episodes that we do. But, you know, as far as, I mean, I just found out about the Weston, uh, comic panels, this, uh, just like I said, right before we went on. So there's still, they're still moving some pieces around. So, uh, so always check. So, um, well, that's it for just the basic news and notes that I've got general speaking. Um, but there were a ton of guest announcements made since our last recording. So we've got a special duo here uh, to to list off the names. So Darren and Zan, uh, take it away. Yeah, get ready. This is a great audition for them, folks. <laughs> this is my first time reading the guest list, so I'm, I'm super excited about this. And just so our listeners know, I just got this list. So hopefully I will pronounce all the names right because it's Dragon Con. And honestly, I never know like all 400 guests. I know a bunch of them, but some of them, this is the first time that I am learning their name and their work. Mm -hmm. So folks, get your alcohol ready. Exactly. Dragon Con is a great way to discover new things, not just enjoy things that you already know that you like. So (laughs) our first guest. You tell it, sister. (laughs) <laughs> it's, I try something new every year, except wrestling. I keep saying I'm going to wrestling, and I never make it to wrestling. But one year, I'll make it to wrestling. This the, could be the year. This could be it. The first guest on the guest list that we're going through here, which is not comprehensive, so please visit dragoncon.org for a complete list. And just so you know, they do tend to announce on social media a day or two before the website gets updated. So just because it's not on the website doesn't mean it's not official. If you see the news online from an official Dragon Con source, like their Facebook page, trust me, it's going to be on the official website soon. Bill Steitler is a writer, director, producer. He used to be an actor until he got tired of dealing with writer, director, producers. He appears on the Bird Chick podcast with his wife, Sharon, as well as the show Aging Poorly and Anti- an anti-nostalgia podcast with Sam Landman. Felix Silla's best-known roles are the maniacal miniature Hitler who menaces George Seagal in The Blackbird and Cousin It on the long-running TV series The Addams Family. Josh Segura currently stars as Adrian Chase slash, spoiler alert, Prometheus on the CW series Arrow. Other recent credits include Judd Apatow's feature film Trainwreck and as Billy Cepeda in the comedy series Sirens on USA. Echo Kellum is an actor and improviser from Chicago, and you can see him on the CW's popular series Arrow as Mr. Terrific. He also recurs on the FX comedy You're the Worst. Derek Hughes is a co-executive producer and writer for television also for video and mobile games and comic books. He's best known for his work on Sci-Fi Channel's Warehouse 13, CW's Beauty and the Beast and The Flash, and most recently, MTV's Scream Season 3. Matt Fraction is an Eisner Award-winning American comic book writer known for his work as the writer of The Invincible Iron Man, The Immortal Iron Fist, Uncanny X-Men, and Hawkeye for Marvel Comics, and Casanova and Sex Criminals for Image Comics. John Barrowman, Do I I even need to keep reading? Does everybody know who John Barrowman is? Um, If you've been to Dragon Con, you know who John Barrowman is. But most recently, he wowed fans with his role as Malcolm Merlin in Arrow and Legends of Tomorrow. And he is also known, we all know him as Captain Jack Harkness from the Doctor Who series and the spinoff Torchwood. And he'll be appearing at Dragon Con Saturday, Sunday, and Monday only. And his photo ops are fantastic. Definitely get one. 
Tony Anselmo is a voice actor and animator who has worked at Walt Disney Animation Studios since 1980 and has been the voice of Donald Duck since 1985, succeeding Clarence Nash, who trained him for the role during the last three years of his life. Charisma Carpenter is best known as Cordelia Chase in the classic television series Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Angel. Julie Benz is the star of cult classics such as Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Angel, and Roswell. Julie Benz has never been one to shy away from the challenging roles and can most recently be seen on Sci-Fi's Defiance. C. Robert Cargill is an author, screenwriter, pod- podcaster, and former film critic. He's the, he's the author of the books Dreams and Shadows, Queen of the Dark Things, and Sea of Rust, and he's a co-writer of the film Sinister, Sinister 2, and Marvel are strange. Carol Berriman, in collaboration with her brother John Berriman, has written two biographies and five novels, including the acclaimed Hollow Earth. Um, she is a middle, gra- oh, a middle grade fantasy series about a brother and sister who can bring their drawings to life and animate it into art. I almost gave her a career as a teacher there for a second. Lieutenant Moxie Magnus, chief cosmetologist on the USS Enterprise, is a mediocre comic and an even mediocre ukulelist. Ukule- I, she plays the ukulele. She has a weekly web comic called Tales from Salon Bay and a YouTube channel, The Moxie Pod. She likes long walks on alien beaches at sunset and gothic romantic novels. I really want to hear somebody play the ukulele at Dragon Con. That sounds mm-hmm. awesome. Moxie can do it. She can. Uh, Sue Kaisenweather has been podcasting about sci-fi, TV, and movies since 2010 and is a three-time Parsec Award finalist. Currently, she co-hosts Women at Warp on the Roddenberry Podcast Network. Sue's been speaking on panels at DragonCon since 2012 and is one of the organizers of the DragonCon Newbies Group. Sharif K. Jackson is a STEM diversity advocate, podcaster, blogger, and YouTuber who has appeared on NPR, Scientific American, and Boing Boing's Offworld. Rachel Scarston is an actress who is best known for her role as Dinah Lance on the television series Birds of Prey, Taz Tamsin in Lost Girl, and Elizabeth I of England in Rain. Paul and Storm have been writing and performing funny songs together for a long, long time, starting with their stint in an acapella band, Da Vinci's Notebook. Their music has appeared on pretty much every type of media that exists. Adelaide Kane gained recognition for her roles as Lolly Allen in the Australian soap opera Neighbors, Cora Hale in the third series of MTV's Teen Wolf, and Mary Queen of Scots in the CW period drama series Rain. Samantha Inu Hart is an established anime industry veteran. She's an anime producer and partner at various Japanese anime studios, a voice actress in anime and video games, and currently producing a live action adaptation of an anime series. Matthew Green. For three decades, he's been one of the Southeast's most famous active filmmakers. Last year, Matt handled production design on the Star Trek fan feature film, Star Trek First Frontier. Matt is currently finishing post-production on the film Horror Show, written by horror novelist and screenwriter John Ferris. Megan Follows is an actress and voice artist best known to international audiences for her roles as Anne Shirley in the 1985 Canadian television miniseries Anne of Green Gables and two of its sequels. For the past four years, she has starred as Catherine De, De Medici in the CW television series Rain. Sarah Olmsted Thomas is an actor, puppeteer, accordionist, and one half of the puppetry duo Alex and Olmsted, which was recently awarded a Jim Henson Foundation grant. John Wesley Shipp played the role of Barry Allen, aka The Flash, in CBS's The Flash from 1990 to 1991, and now he can be seen on the CW's The Flash playing Barry Allen's father, Henry Allen, and he was also on Dawson's Creek, which I only know because my sister loved that show. (laughs) William Shatner is an actor and novelist who gained worldwide fame and became a cultural icon for his portrayal of Captain James T. Kirk, captain of the starship USS Enterprise in the television series Star Trek from 1966 to 69, Star Trek the Animated Series, and in seven of the subsequent Star Trek feature films. Shatner will be joining Dragon Con Sunday and Monday only. Jay Patrick has been a program director for the top radio broadcast companies in the U.S. In 2011, he turned his professional knowledge to the increasing world of internet content via podcasting. Currently, Jay Patrick is the co-host of the new podcast, 
Pod Casserole, an Adam and JP show. And a member of the Al ESO Lowe. network. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Al Lowe is best known as the creator of the Leisure Suit Larry series of video games produced by Sierra Online back in the golden age of adventure gaming. Jonathan Frakes is best known for his portrayal of Commander William Riker in this television series, Star Trek Next Generation, and has also done a lot of work as a director. Michael Dorn donned mounds of facial makeup for what was to be his signature role, the USS Enterprise's Klingon Officer Lieutenant Worf on Star Trek The Next Generation from 87 to 94. Michael reprised his role of Worf on Star Trek Deep Space Nine in 95 to 99. Jessica Camacho is the Chicago-born, Puerto Rican-rooted film and television actress. You can catch up with her on CW Network's The Flash, where she plays the multiverse-hopping bounty hunter and crush of Cisco, Gypsy. Maisie Richardson Sellers is known for her recurring role as Rebecca Michelson um, slash Ava Sinclair in the second season of the CW series, The Originals, and as Amaya on the CW television super seri- superhero series, Legends of Tomorrow. She'll be appearing Saturday through Monday. Danielle Panabaker can currently be seen playing Caitlin Snow in the CW series, The Flash. Matt Letcher is currently filming DC Legends of Tomorrow, where he plays the reverse Flash. Matt received a lot of attention on his recurring role in the final season of Boardwalk Empire as Joseph Kennedy. Alex Kingston is an English actress who is best known for her roles as Dr. Elizabeth Corday on the NBC medical drama ER and as fan favorite River Song in the BBC science fiction series Doctor Who. Ashley McCall Scott is an actress and model who is best known for her roles in the television series Jericho, Birds of Prey, and Dark Angel. She will be reuniting with her castmates for a Birds of Prey reunion. Most fans know Claire Kramer from her cult hits such as Bring It On with Elijah Dushku and as Glory from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. In 2012, Claire launched the entertainment website and pop culture phenomenon GeekNation.com. Uh, the sci-fi janitors are Dragon Con's very own geek ambassadors to puppetry. Uh, catch Bob and Carl on Dragon Con TV and live in the puppetry track since their debut on Dragon Con TV in 2010. They have been entertaining audiences at, at cons as well as at home with their web series. And that's Matt Nietzsche, but who's the other? They are two different janitors, right? Yeah, yeah Bob, Bob and Carl. And Carl. Well, Bob yeah. and Carl. Is it just Matt doing them? Please no. say no. No. That can't no. be. All right. Okay, okay. Just making sure. Mary Mary Elizabeth McGlynn is perhaps best known for her work in Code Geass. I'm not sure about that one. We'll just go with that. Ghost in the Shell and Hack. Crystal Bright and the Silver Hands is what it would sound like if Kate Bush were to genetically fuse with Danny Elfman and Dresden Dolls in some strange biological experiment. Brian Brushwood is the host of Scam School for Discovery. Hacking the System for National Geographic, and now the modern rogue on YouTube. When he's not on camera, he's shoving fire in his face and nails in his eyes nationwide with his bizarre magic show. Steve Bloom is best known as the voice of Spike Spiegel from Cowboy Bebop, Wolverine from several incarnations of X-Men, and Zeb from Star Wars Rebels. Steve was inducted into the Guinness Book of World Records as most prolific voice actor in video games, appearing in almost 300 games. Whoa, that is a lot of games. Kevin Alejandro is well known for his roles as Nate Moretta in the crime drama Southland, as well as Jesus Velasquez in the supernatural thriller True Blood, and as Sebastian Blood slash Brother Blood in the CW series Arrow, and also Dan Espinosa on Lucifer. Janet Varney is an actress and comedian best known for hosting TBS's Dinner in a Movie and the voice of Cora in The Legend of Cora. Gigi Ed- Edgley is best known for Swarscape, and she's also known for Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge, Feud, Bet and Joan, Quantum Apocalypse, Showdown at Area 51, Enuadi, Face Off Designer's new feature film, Lost World, also Beastmaster, Nexus, Hashtag. Just the beginning of the list of her extensive credits. She also writes comics, and she hosts, and she is a recording artist. Cartoon Best Network known for being awesome. Yeah, very awesome. Cartoon Network's wildly popular Adult Swim block was built on the cult hit Space Goes Coast to Coast, which ran for a decade with legions of fans responsible for its success, with George Lowe providing the ad-libbing madman behind Space Coast. 
Neil McDonough portrays Damien Dark in a major recurring role in the fourth season of Arrow and in DC's Legends of Tomorrow, because that show loves crossovers, and also Dum Dung Dugan of the Howling Commandos in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Garrett Wang is best known for his role as Ensign Harry Kim on Star Trek Voyager, which ran from 95 to 2001. He was keen to participate in a new role for the 2007 fan production Star Trek of Gods and Men. I wonder how he got in. I don't don't know. know. I bet the track director had to pull a lot of strings to get to get him at this show. Spoiler alert, kids. Garrett Wang is the track track director. (laughs) And he's been known to pop up at the Eternal Party. So that was really nice. So, Alex Vernon is an actor, puppeteer, maker, silhouettist, and automata repairer. Aaron Sagers is a TV host, author, journalist, and social media influencer. He appears as host on Sci-Fi, Travel Channel, Today Show, TLC, True TV, MTV, and more. He's editor-at-large for Sci-Fi's entertainment site, is contributing author to Doctor Who Psychology, and as a paranormal expert, is author of Paranormal Pop Culture. Billy Mitchell Mitchell Jr. is an American video game player. He has recorded high scores on classic games from the golden age of arcade video games. David Ramsey, writing for the Oxford American in 2006, called Mitchell probably the greatest arcade video player of all time. Mitchell's signature achievement is earning the first perfect score of 3,000,000. 333,360 points on the original Pac-Man arcade game on July 4th, 1999. God bless America. (laughs) Lynn Hansen is an award-winning director and screenwriter. Her films have appeared in over 65 film festivals and won over 30 awards. Jeff Burns is the creator of the Amazon Prime series Super Knocked Up, host of geeky improv show Super Geeked Up Live, and a published comic book writer. He moderates panels at conventions across North America, including San Diego Comic-Con, Fan Expo Canada, Emerald City Comic-Con, WonderCon, and Montreal Comic-Con. Acceleration Alexandria is a costumer and fabricator working at Tinsley Studio. Her last completed projects were HBO's Westworld, Netflix's Santa Clarita Diet, and Star's American Gods. Katie Townsend is most recognized as the voice of Celtic pit fighter Kate in Fallout 4, whilst traveling the globe as a truth seeker clue in Ingress. Katie plays Suvi Anwar in Mass Effect, the Andromeda series, as well as a Sylvie Timberwolf in Monster High, Electrified. Katie Sackhoff's rough-and-ready portrayal of hotshot pilot Kara Starbuck Thrace has been stealing scenes on the critically acclaimed Battlestar Galactica for years now, turning heads and winning a Saturn Award along the way. Robert Alsop has worked in film, theater, and television as a specialist costumer for the last 30 years. He is known for his work on Ridley Scott movies, including The Martian. He created the principal costumes for Dread 3D and has worked on many classic and recent Doctor Who episodes. The diverse actress Ming-Na Wen can currently be seen as one of the leads of Joss Whedon's Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Previously, she has been seen on ER, SGU Stargate Universe, and Eureka, and heard as the voice of Mulan. She will be appearing on Saturday only. Elizabeth Henstridge is an English actress who is best known for her role in ABC's Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as Agent Jenna Simmons. So she's part of Fitzsimmons. She will be appearing Saturday and Sunday only. Brett Dalton is an American actor who is best known for playing Grant Ward in ABC's series Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., currently in its third season. Jewel State recently joined the cast of the sci-fi hit Stargate Atlantis as Dr. Keller, in addition to shooting the lead role in the feature The Tribe, which depicts the story of five young adults shipwrecked on a desert island off the coast of Latin America, where they encounter a lost tribe of savages. Jewel is best known for her role in Joss Whedon's Firefly. Okay, that bio was written a while ago because she didn't just recently join the yeah. cast of Stargate yeah, Atlantis. That show I was thinking that too. A while. Just yeah. so you guys know, I was just Stargate waiting. Atlantis didn't just recently come back. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I was just waiting for them to say this brand new <laughs> show called Firefly coming out. <laughs> <laughs> it's a copy-paste job. We all know. We've all seen them. Proof your, proof your copy, people. 
Rachel Luttrell is an accomplished actress and singer who has worked in film, television, and on stage. Rachel was cast in the role of Tila Emigan on the Sci-Fi Channel spinoff series Stargate Atlantis, a show that won the loyalty of a worldwide fan base and ran for five very successful seasons. There you go. <laughs> Christopher Judge is the legendary sci-fi and voice actor best known for his role as Teal'c in Stargate SG-1, and now as Kratos in God of War 4, and I made him cry during a panel once. That's Joe, a story for another time. Joe <laughs> Not making Flanagan. it up it's true, I made Christopher Judge cry in public. Wow. <laughs> Joe Flanagan is an American television actor best known as Major Lieutenant Colonel John Shepard in Stargate Atlantis. Rick Cosnett is an actor best known for his role as Eddie Thawne on The Flash, Wes Maxfield on The Vampire Diaries, and Elias Harper on Quantico. With an impressive body of work spanning the course of two decades, John Cusack has evolved into one of Hollywood's most accomplished and respected actors of his generation, garnering both critical acclaim as well as prestigious accolades for his dramatic and comedic roles. Joe Pruitt is an Eisner Award-winning comic book editor, publisher, and writer, having been nominated for numerous Eisner, Harvey, and Eagle Awards. He's written for virtually every other major comic publisher, including Marvel, Image, Vertigo, IDW, and Aftershock. Currently, he's the publisher slash COO of Aftershock Comics. Ned Bellamy entered show business in the very late 70s, initially on television programs including The Waltons, MASH, and The Dukes of Hazard. As time rolled on, however, Bellamy uh, move more squarely into filmed work, specializing in action, horror, or thriller fare. And finally, the Muckers embody Irish rock with a twinge of sea shanties and gypsy music. Yay! That's awesome, guys. Whew. Thank you so much for that. That was I a know, lot right? of guests. I mean, That's, that was it, just a small, small portion of the total guests that are coming to Dragon Con. And absolutely. Zan has a personal story about each and every one of them. <laughs> I also have a story about Jewel State. So, See, I knew it. I knew it. How many guests have you made cry? Uh, no, uh, <laughs> How many hosts uh, of podcasts has she made? Cry? No, have you made cry? <laughs> hey, unexpected uh, things happen at Dragon Con. I wasn't even trying, and then when it was over, I was like, "Did that just happen?" Wow. Uh, well, that's it's awesome. Uh, the guest list this year is really, as you guys mentioned, robust. It's amazing. Uh, John Cusack is a just a huge get. Uh, that guy does not do a lot of conventions. Um, so that's an impressive uh, name among many impressive names. Now, uh, they're not done. Uh, you know, we've still got about three weeks to go before as we're recording this before the big event. So um, there could be some other announcements. Uh, Dragon Con has been known to drop and uh, drop a few big names at the last minute. Um there- With all the good news of all the guests that's coming, I should point out that there is a bit of bad news. Uh, due to filming, uh, Lena Headley, uh, or Hetty, will not be able to make it this year. So, Headley? Uh, yes. Oh, God. It's going with the Mel Brooks there. I know, right? an amazing scene in Game of Thrones this week. So Absolutely. good. Yes. Um, so for Game of Thrones fans, for 300 fans, for uh, Terminator, uh, the Avengers of Sarah Chronicle fans, as well as many things else that she's done. Oh, she was awesome in Dread. She, uh, unfortunately, she will not uh, uh, be there. Yeah, there's not a, jet, a Dread uh, reunion with her and Carl this year. So that's kind of a bummer. But. Dragon Con assures us they are working hard to find a replacement. So, um, and when I when they say that, I'm thinking they're targeting the Game of Thrones stat, uh, cast. So, uh, I would not be surprised in the next few weeks if you hear uh, um, uh, for Game of Thrones fans a name out there. I doubt you're going to get anybody as big uh, as uh, you know Lena, but you never know. So, uh, so watch that space. Uh, of course, watch the Facebook page as Zan pointed out. That's where news usually drops first. So, and it's always official. Like if it happens there, then that's where you know that's you'll find out then. So, um, thanks guys, we appreciate it. And uh, now that we've gotten all the news and the announcements out of the way, it's it's time to talk to some folks behind the scenes. And and we're going to start off with talking to our good friend of the station, the director of media uh, media relations. Uh, Dan Carroll is is with us, and we are talking to him now. And now, once again, we are we are truly blessed to be joined by Dan Carroll, our good friend and the director of media relations and the official spokesman. Can I say that? 
Yes, you can. Are you the official mascot? I am not the official mascot. I am the official <laughs> voice and face of Dragon Con. Well, that's that almost as the, good as a mascot, right? That's what the board tells me, so I trust them. <laughs> does does uh, Dragon Con have a mascot? It it has a dragon in our emblem, but I don't think we have an official mascot the way our our partner convention Momocon does. Gotcha. Hey, maybe maybe that's something we could look into. That is. Well, um, very exciting. You know, it's about what a month away, so uh, it's uh, it's hard to believe that it's uh, coming up so quick. But it, it usually happens this time of year, doesn't it? It does. It does. It it. Uh, you know, I was just thinking, oh, Dragon Con seventy days away, and this morning I was thinking it's much closer, <laughs> much much closer than that. Absolutely, absolutely. Last year, of course, was the thirtieth anniversary, and it was a huge to do. Um, and and I and I take it on Dragon Con's end, everything was a, a success. Uh, it was a big success last year. It was. Yeah. Uh, I know from our department's point of view, we we uh, we continued to have uh, uh, just a rousing success uh, with the recognition from the local reporters, the uh, recognition from the city itself. It, uh, I'm sure you're aware last year the mayor declared it Dragon Con weekend. Absolutely. A whole weekend. I, I, I do recall us having Dragon Con Day before, but not the whole weekend. It did. We, we had a press conference and a presentation of awards by the mayor. Uh, and uh, we had never had anything like that at City Hall before. And it was it was an absolute pleasure to meet with the city council and uh, and to, to talk with the mayor about his love for Dragon Con and what Dragon Con means to the city. And and the close link between Dragon Con success and uh, laying the groundwork for the expansion of the film industry here in Atlanta. And those are I, his words, not mine. Well, absolutely. I, and I do think that's true. I mean, so many people that, uh, you know, that we knew back, I don't know, 15 years ago that were going to Dragon Con and cosplaying are now actively involved behind the scenes with makeup, wardrobe, behind the scenes stuff with actual filmmaking that's going on here. Uh, and, and that is that is more true than ever. Uh, you know, I, I love being able to go to the movies and, and see my my city. I love so much on the screen. Yep. And then we'll see it. And then you see it again. Represent. You can recreate actual sequences now at Dragon Con. Absolutely. One of the uh, funniest things I've read all uh, all, all springtime was a critique of Baby Driver in Atlanta magazine. And one of their. One of their things that they felt was a failing was that it did not include Dragon Con customers during <laughs> the they, scenes of Peachtree Center. When they were going through the food court. And it, yeah, there, a lot of those things look very familiar, except you're right. It didn't have a lot of customers there. No, but that's I, I bet we're going to see a lot of uh, B-A-B-Y baby represented at Dragon Con this year. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. And then, of course, you know, there was some famous shots, at least in the trailers for Spider-Man uh, from the Marriott Hotel. So that was uh, that was impressive. And, yeah, just a lot of stuff. Um, that's really cool. Going going forward now. So now we're, you know, three decades of Dragon Con. We're going forward. Yes. This is a, a new era almost, but obviously it's not brand new. Um, tell us about Dragon Con this year, the, the big plans. Well, some of the things that that. Um we're pretty excited about is that we are moving registration over to the Hilton this year. And that gives us much greater expanded track space in the Sheraton. Yes. Uh, all the hotels are amazing and, and having, having track space in the Sheraton is going to be able to give us more room for the tracks that have more, more, uh, participants, uh, I strongly recommend you download the Dragon Con app to get those exact details about what's moving where. Uh, the Blood Bank is moving out of the Hilton into the basement of the Hyatt. That's also pretty exciting because it's going to give them more space and a little bit more privacy because it's going to be in multiple rooms right down by the Media Relations Department. That's very cool. Uh, That's the first I've heard of that. That's awesome. Yes. Well, uh, Dragon Con people like to give. They give a lot of blood. We're expecting a special award this year with a special presentation, and the media will be invited to it. But one of the things that, that I also want to throw out was that um, with that move, 
We have the blood bank coming over. We at DragonCon give a lot, and now I'm back on track. And one of the things we're going to be doing this year is our charity will be, um, our charity will be Georgia Special Olympics, and we're really excited about that. But but the thing that's really cool is that we have upped the DragonCon corporate match match for donations to one hundred thousand dollars. Wow, that's that's big money. So we for the past couple of years we've been matching up to fifty thousand. Last year we raised over a hundred thousand dollars for the Atlanta Center for Self Sufficiency. Yep. This year we're matching up to a hundred thousand dollars for the Special Olympics, and we're really excited about that. I am actually wearing, as I talk to you, my Dragon Con superheroes T-shirt. <laughs> you must have. I bet you have enough Dragon Con uh, wear to to. To cover you every day, I have enough Dragon Con wear to build a comforter. You know, what's it called? A quilt? Yeah. That would cover a king bed. Nice. So the day will come when I will pull that out of storage and start that process of making my Dragon Con T-shirt quilt. <laughs> that would be very. That would be that would be a conversation starter. It would. So, um, so back to the, the charity. So the, the charity this year, you said, is uh, Special Olympics, correct? That's correct. Georgia Special Olympics. Awesome. And and just, you know, as usual, how can people participate in, in, in donating to that? Well, uh, first off, go to the DragonCon.org website. Take a look at the charities. And they talk about the charity auction and how to donate to the charity auction. Also, come to DragonCon, participate in the auction, and buy cool stuff. That's the best. That's the easiest way. Oh yeah, and and we're we've we've done really well with our charity auction uh, in the past. And uh, uh, Jen Breland, who's the head of charities for DragCon, has just continued to do amazing work uh, in terms of raising that that bar each year. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it is it is a a point of uh, pride now. Oh yes, but it's it's mostly. Indicative of the type of people who are coming to DragonCon, people who want to give, people who care. Uh, each of the tracks normally does some sort of crazy stunt. If they raise so many thousands of dollars, somebody will do something from having their beard shaved off in public to costuming after years of saying you weren't going to costume ever. Uh, we Ben been at Connor a couple of years ago, raised enough money that she wore a Wonder Woman outfit. Wow, those can be kind of snug. I, I mine fits fine. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> any, um, any. I mean, obviously, we uh, and it's a challenge for us to cover all the guests that are are coming this year, but uh, or any year for that matter. But um, are there? You would definitely, you know, Dragon Con still has has put out the the red carpet and there are there are some big names coming this year as well. And that's it. I mean there's so many you can go go look at uh the DragonCon website again. Don't underestimate just how great that is a resource. But I just want to hit on the folks who've just been announced this week. Sure. Um we started the week with Jewel State, uh Rachel Latrell, Chris Judge, Joe Flanagan uh, so many great Stargate guests being announced all together in a group. Uh, we also have Rick Costner joining the rest of the CW guests we already have, such as Daniel Pennebaker. Um, but he plays Eddie Thawne on the, on the Flash, uh, and he's coming back. He's also been in Vampire Diaries and Quantico. So... We've got those Stargate folks. We've got folks from The Flash. We got folks from Arrow. We got folks from so many of the popular CW shows. But the big thing that's been announced is that we have John Cusack joining us this year. That was a mic drop boom moment. Boom. It was. And I was just as surprised as anyone. Uh, <laughs> one of the great things about my job is that I find out exactly when you guys do. So it still keeps that excitement fresh. Uh, John Cusack, obviously, in the 80s, he was one of the biggest, hottest stars there was. 
Uh, moving on, you know, he's always been been working. He always has great roles. He's a he's an actor's actor. Comes from this family of of actors. Um, and we're so happy about that. Uh, and then we we also have uh, some other guests that have been announced recently. Uh, probably the one that made everybody most excited was Ming Na Wen. Uh, and uh, I know her as Deb Chen. A lot of people know her from the TV show Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And she's also going to be joined with a couple other Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. guests, Elizabeth Hedstridge and Brett Dalton. Um, again, a very popular show. Last year it seemed like we had a lot of Gotham guests. This year we're bringing the Marvel with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. And that's what, they, I mean, I mean, that's just recent the what's been recently announced but of course you know uh people need to look at at the whole list and oh, there's just sure. tons of big lists and including you know um matt smith as uh the 11th doctor um all the way to you know all the next generation folks you have i mean it's just it's it continues to amaze me no and we've got these great not just matt smith but but we also have uh billy piper coming uh, we've right. got uh, John Barrowman returning and so many other Doctor Who guests. We've got Katie Sackoff uh, from Battlestar Galactica and so many other great, great uh, shows. And then probably uh, the thing about it is, is there, we've also really expanded our comic book guests. We've got Babs Tar coming. Oh, yeah. um, having that larger space has really made uh, the comic and pop art alley world class uh you know other conventions are losing their comic book guests and losing their comic book influence where we are just expanding recently uh dragon con was featured uh in an article that i had nothing to do with where they specifically singled out that the comic and pop art alley is not like anything else in the country and you can get face to face with these artists with these creators and um you know, they basically they're creating the source material for most of the movies we're seeing these days. It's uh, it's definitely come a long way, um, as as a lot of the tracks have, and uh, it's certainly the comic and pop art area is one that I'm very proud to be part of every year. So, um, and it's it's you know for anybody if there's anybody out there that still thinks that Dragon Con has a reputation of not being a quote unquote Comic Con, I, I dare you to, to try to take on the entire artist alley area in one day. You just can't do it. It's too big. So uh, it, it's really awesome. And and that's backed up with a comics programming track that's oh, very yes. successful. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. My well, la cool. I, I will say my last year as a non, my last year as a non uh, director at Dragon Con, most of the programming I went to was comics, and that's where I met your former co-host and the first of the ESO folks that I met, Bobby Nash. Sure, sure. I, I, you know what? I think that's one of the first places I ever met Bobby Nash was at Dragon Con. So, oh, many, many, many moons ago. So, um, yeah, and there's still, and that's the thing. It's like there's a lot of obviously professional creators who are working and 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 selling out comics uh, left and right today, but also a lot of indie guys. So there's a really nice. Nice mix of folks. So I, I do appreciate that. The um, and uh, you know, of course, I want to talk about now. Is the I know um, the parade was was broadcast last year. Is that is there um, going to be? Is that scheduled to be broadcast again this year? How did that work out? Yeah, it worked out very well. Very well. It is scheduled to be rebroadcast. In fact, they're probably going to have more expansive coverage this year than they had last year. Last year was kind of an experiment. Very nice. And uh, we're pretty excited about that. And uh, despite rumors to, of its demise, it, this is not the last Dragon Con parade. Yay! We always love hearing that. We have we have uh, worked through many details to make sure that it will continue to happen. Awesome! And we're very very excited about that. Well, very cool. Is uh, anything else that you want to give us a heads up on to to, to look out especially for th this year? Well, a couple of things. One of one of them is that we've had some track realignment, and uh, one of the things that's great is that uh, Game of Thrones had not had a home at DragonCon, and the high fantasy track has combined the energy of the Tolkien track. Um, they're adding in the the works of Terry Brooks. They're reviving the interest in, in the Wheel of Time 
at Dragon Con, and they're rolling it all into this fantasy track that that focuses specifically on high fantasy. And um, they're still going to be having the evening at Bree and all the things they like. And probably two things that that we we hardly ever talk about is Dragon Con has so many great, very very fun parties. Not just the evening at Bree, but the Heroes and Villains Ball, the Doctor Who Ball. So many parties going all night long. And um, we just announced the Steam Powered Giraffe will be joining us, uh, one of the most popular steampunk bands ever. And he, they're joining uh, Valentine Wolf. I think they're friends of the ESO Network. And so many other fun bands that are going to be performing nearly 24 hours a day at Dragon Con. And sometimes, sometimes I don't get a chance to talk about those parties or those bands because at Dragon Con I tend to be working. So yes. I, I don't get to enjoy them. Yeah, as, well, and yeah, and and they are. I mean, the music level has just gotten been phenomenal too. Uh, uh, you know, every time a band's announced, I'm I'm very excited. Yes, and I mean, we have a long tradition of of hosting bands like War and Alice Cooper and and Starship, not Jefferson Starship. Oh no, I guess right. they were just called. Starship. Starship. I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. Right. <laughs> I, they kept changing their name. So we had we had the Starship and, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, just so many bands. Uh, you know, in fact, uh, I don't know if you know this, but at our first Dragon Con, uh, we had Michael Moorcock. Uh, and Michael Moorcock was most famous for being a writer. Yep. But he also co-wrote the song uh, Veteran of a Thousand Psychic Wars with Blue Oyster Cult, and he performed that live at the first Dragon Con. Wow, I did not know that. I, I, I did uh, not know he performed that. I love that song. I'm, yeah, a, it's, I'm a big BOC fan. Right, but more importantly, it's from one of the greatest soundtracks in the history of nerddom. Are you talking about heavy metal? Of course I you're talking, talking about heavy about metal. That one-way ticket to midnight. <laughs> That's awesome. It is. Well, cool. It is. It's I uh, just... May I say it's inspiration on a red line? It yes, absolutely. Uh, you know uh, what? If you're going to quote heavy metal, we'll just let you go because uh, yeah. that's that's pretty awesome. Because we could we could quote heavy metal all night long. It is a it is a it's a Loch Nor delight. Um, <laughs> but but seriously, uh, if you want to get a hold of me, send me an email at meteorrelations at dragoncon.org. If you want to find out more, meteorrelations dot dragoncon.org. Uh, basically, my job is to talk about the convention, but also process reporters who are interested. Applications close August 20th. Feel free to apply to be a reporter at DragonCon if you're with the ESO network or you have a substantial established media outlet. We'd be very happy to talk to you and investigate your website. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us once again. It's great to talk to you this long because we don't usually get that. If we see you at Dragon Con, it's usually a more brief. So uh, it's 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 really cool to talk to you. And, you know, you're, like you said, uh, awesome guests, awesome parties, uh, awesome, awesome good times. So we are definitely looking forward to it, to seeing you all in about a month. That's wonderful. Can't wait to see you, folks. Cool. We'll see you at the con. Okie dokie. And now we are joined by the director of the Urban Fantasy Track, Carol Malcolm. Carol, welcome to the station. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, um, for those people who may not be familiar with your, your track, what, what exactly does your, your track and room entail? Urban Fantasy probably can best be defined as, not it, it, people think of it as always modern world. And that's probably a fairly accurate description, but it's a recognizable world. Let's put it that way. You can also have urban fantasy that takes place in a historical context, but basically it's a recognizable world. It might be a slightly alternate version of it because what you have is some form of the supernatural, whether it be, you know, ghosts, any form of magic, uh, vampires, werewolves, all, all, you know, any kind of supernatural beings. That's how you can best define urban fantasy. Now, my track does cover both books and media at DragonCon, and which I'm 
a big fan of you know of both mediums so that was that's just great for me gotcha so what are some of the franchises that you guys cover oh my we cover a, a number of different different television programs at uh, this point in time we have 15 and uh, let's see, I can even give you, I'll, well, first I'll tell you the ones that we have, have represented at Con this year, which are uh, Buffy and Angel, which okay. my track uh, inherited when, you know, the Whedonverse became no longer, right. uh, when it was disbanded. And then we also uh, have, we have people from Buffy and Angel coming. We have people from Winona Earp coming almost the whole cast from there so it's going to be pretty busy and <laughs> yeah and then we also have uh, some lucifer cast members coming people are very excited about that as well absolutely wow so that's that's some high profile stuff right there right and those are just the ones that have actual cast members coming we we cover a lot of other shows like i zombie and which we had cast from them last year and also um we had uh, or we in the past we've had lost girl we've had bitten we've had the u.s uh, being human uh, cast and they were great so we we've been very fortunate to have some of the folks that we've that we've had over in the past and this year even though we we have cast from those uh, four properties we will also have fan panels over all of the other shows that we cover uh, you know things like the new midnight texas for one is one of those and uh, you know the vampire diaries and sleepy hollow which are leaving us and teen wolf which we will be saying goodbye to as well so it's it's always kind of bittersweet when that happens it's fun to see people get excited but then they also get kind of sad when it's somebody or something that they really enjoy having to say goodbye to it oh absolutely absolutely uh and yeah it seems like well i mean it, it yeah every year we get new shows but every year you know shows disappear and, and that's not right. not just shows but uh movie franchises and you guys you said you handle literature as well yes yes we're very very fortunate that we've had some really big names in the field that have you know, been at con with us over the last few years. This is the fifth year of the track. Okay. And th we've been very fortunate. And this year uh, we actually have five separate, uh, you know, really big names in addition to, you know, 35 other authors who will be featured on panels as well who will right. take part in the programming but we have jim butcher who is a you know a perennial favorite of course and sure. then um and laurel k hamilton and Sherilyn kenyon uh both of whom are also veterans and then for the first time we will have kim harrison which is uh which is a really big deal i'm very pleased about that and patricia briggs is coming the second year in a row also somebody we're very we're very lucky to have again wow so you've got so between the just the literary authors and the you know tv and movie guests and the fan panels that that sounds like a full four days of programming right there it is indeed for every time slot we have and well for almost every time slot maybe a few of the later night things we don't but for most of them I would say for 90% of the slots, we have at least two things going on at once, either, you know, something in the track room and something in the big room. Now you said that so. uh, this is the fifth year you said for the yes. track? Uh, yes. Congratulations on five years. Thank you. And, and have you been associated with this track for all five years? Yes. Oh, well, wow. Cool. Very cool. Yes. And the way that the track kind of came about was that you, you guys may remember in the past the dark fantasy track yes yes and dark fantasy started out as something else i believe it was called gothic shadows or something to that effect and that was before i was involved with it but then um the the guy who was the track director in 2008 was looking for someone to help out when it was dark fantasy um was looking for someone to help out with some of the, the great influx of authors that he was getting. 
and uh, I we didn't know each other personally other than interacting in a book club online, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but I said, hey, that sounds like something that I would enjoy. So, uh, you know, somehow I ended up working at Dragon Con for him for five years. And then what happened was the track was becoming, there was so much to cover. It was, be, it was becoming such a wide variety of things that needed to be done that he had suggested the split. And what he did was he took horror and I took urban fantasy. That was the, the natural split between the, you know, all of the different areas that were being covered by, you know, by dark fantasy and that it was just a little bit too general of a term, but most people get it when you meet, when you say horror or when you say urban fantasy. So at least, a, you know, a more general idea. So that's how the split came about. Gotcha. And that makes sense, too, because I was I was trying to remember the history of this track in Conehead because I've been going for over 20 years and um, um, and I couldn't remember this particular track. And then, so now that you now you, now you mention it, I can't remember that there being like a, a, a horror track, at least name that for, you know, but I do remember these sort of uh, dark. You said dark shadows and, and then dark fantasy. Right. Because I think. Right. That was like a big deal. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that was like a big deal when like Clive Barker came. Was that it, part of that programming? It probably was, but that was before my involvement with the track. But gotcha. I, but yes, he would have been. He he would have definitely been involved with it if at that point in time. I mean, right. if you know when it existed. But uh, yes, and that's so we're kind of the, you know. <laughs> we're, we're we're siblings we still yeah. we still feel that connection so. gotcha you're kind of what's left of the goth movement at dragon con is that right is that fair <laughs> well that that actually gets still covered um a little bit of that they still they still discuss on the horror track okay gotcha uh, yeah yeah they they still do a little bit of that programming and they you know, there are a lot of places where we kind of overlap where, sure. but, uh, Derek, the horror director and I are very good friends. And so we manage to, we coordinate and yet we also make sure we don't overlap too much because we don't want, we want there to be that distinction so that people will know what, what the difference is. So, so when was your first Dragon Con personally? My first Dragon Con was in 2003 and I came to actually get to see James Marsters. I think he was the only Buffy cast member who was there that year. And I, that was, you know, right about the time the show ended and yeah, I, I had to come. And prior to that, I actually had never been, not because I didn't want to, but because I worked for a school that was a private school and it didn't, I'm a former school librarian and it didn't, we didn't have Labor Day off. Gotcha. It was, yeah. It was not a holiday. So I could never just kind of take the whole time and, uh, you know, come down there and spend the time. It's a little too far away to go. If you wanted to go back and forth every day, it wouldn't really make sense. And it was, it just never really worked out for me, but uh, that was my first, my first visit. And then five years later was when I started working there. Wow. Okay. So yeah, it didn't take long for you to get involved in at all. And now no. you're, now you're really deep in it. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> but, but, but you still get to enjoy it. Of course. Yes. And, you know, I mean, I, I think that, that part of it is you have to, well, you know, we're all volunteers and it's, you have to love what you're doing. And part of that is, I think it's, it's kind of cyclical. You kind of, you try to create programming that, you know, people are going to enjoy coming to, but it also has to be stuff that you enjoy doing or else you're not going to be really giving them what they want. Right. If that makes sense. And no, absolutely. You know, so I think that it, you know, it's, um, it, it is, it's, it's, a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And, you know, it's great to see the same attendees every year, people who come back over and over again. And, you know, I've, I've 
I've been very fortunate. We have really good fans as far as, you know, all the people who come. We have probably, I would say, we have a portion of our crowd that enjoys both of the mediums that we cover. But then we have some people who are specifically there for the book panels and that kind of programming. And then we have other people that are, you know, specifically there for the media programming. But but there is crossover from both. And it's it's always nice to see that everybody enjoys it, you know, from both sides of the aisle, so to speak. Sure. Well, we've definitely seen, you know, talking to a lot of track directors and experiencing myself, um, I mean, I tend to, 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 to bounce around from tracks to track. But since I've been uh, in the, the comic area, the comic and, and pop art area as a guest um, the last few years, I kind of, that's my home base, but I try to bounce around with other tracks. And I've noticed that, you know, it really is true. I mean, there's 30 some tracks at Dragon Con and each one is like a little mini convention that has their own group of people that just come just for that track. That is true. And I, one of the, one of the things that I have actually encouraged people to do, especially when it comes to different authors, is to try to kind of spread the love. You know, I mean, there even if there's a if there's a writer who writes primarily in my genre that doesn't mean that they don't fit in some other areas as well and you know the, there might be uh, well for example we have one author who's been, been a supporter of the track from the beginning who now has actually written a couple of different comics and so she she's going to be in some comics program and she's on the fantasy lit track because she writes that she's got a new star wars book coming out this year and so you know she's going to be doing some programming with them and i really like to see that i like to have people get used by multiple tracks simply because it gives them exposure to people who might not see them if they only stay on one track all the time absolutely absolutely um, what would you say, you know, and this could be personal or your track oriented or just things that happened before you were involved in track, but what would you say is maybe one of the biggest highlights that you've ever, the best things that you have experienced at Dragon Con? Hmm. Well, we've had some, some very special moments, I think, of just some of the different, some of the different guests, whether they be media or author guests who have done things that sometimes it's, you know, spur of the moment uh, kinds of things where, well, for example, it was last year we had uh, an author who decided during a panel that he was going to uh, auction off a, it was a picture of that, that another one of the panelists had drawn of him. He does, he did a little, you know, some, uh, cartooning type things and so he drew a picture of this author and he also happened to have uh i would say maybe a quarter of a bottle of whiskey left with <laughs> that was actually some very fine whiskey and so he signed the bottle and anyway they auctioned it off to for charity and whoever you know whoever got the or, you know bid the highest amount got the goodies it was also a note that these guys were writing back and forth that included the the caricature and it was uh it to me that was a very spontaneous spur of the moment kind of thing that did not detract at all because it was not it happened at you know during the the aftermath of the panel or the you know the, like during the q a kind of session and not right in the middle of things it wasn't as though it disrupted anything uh, you know, n nothing like that. And so that was really cool that, that somebody would do that. W what we've done the past couple of years for the charity drive is to have what we call the battle of the, of the UF track show fandoms. And what I do is I put out these uh, containers that are for each show and people can compete you know, by trying to seeing seeing which show gains the the greatest donations, 
uh, the, or the highest, you know, the highest amount. And then, of course, that's for whatever the Dragon Con charity of the year is. So that's been a lot of fun. And so that's what they were doing uh, during this last year to uh, nice. raise the money. So, yeah, that that was a lot of fun. And I think when it comes to the media guests, I, I think what happens with them is you can tell that I've been very fortunate in the people that I've had. They've they've all been very fan friendly. They uh, enjoy the format that we do. Our the the media panels I do are always uh, audience Q and A, so people get a chance to ask questions themselves, and they you can tell that that sometimes you know a, a particular question really catches them. And it's, it's, that's kind of fun to see just that when they get, have that kind of that moment, you know, when they are, they're saying, wow, either it's something they've never been asked before or something that really is just put to them in such a way that they, you know, feel very special themselves. And, and I, I think that that's, that's something that's a lot of fun as well. Absolutely. And that's one of those things, yes, that's definitely a highlight uh, of Dragon Con, uh, for sure, because it really is more about the fans interacting with them that rather than just, you know, I mean, certainly there's the Walk of Fame and there's photo ops and all that kind of stuff. But really, there's a lot of interaction that goes on with the panels and, and, and fans and, and those those experiences, even from a celebrity point of view, um, because they're fans, too, and, and they get to really have experiences that way. So. Well, very cool. Well, um, we're definitely excited to uh, with all the things that's going on with your track. Of course, with the rescheduling of of some of the topics, uh, some of the like the Buffy and the Weed and stuff that 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 you've inherited. Uh, it's exciting that uh, you'll be able to present that as well. Um, now, um, have you have you moved? What, what room or where can people find you at DragonCon? Well, we are still in the Westin. Okay. And we're still on the same floor. We used to be uh, in Chastain D and E, which were the, those were the rooms that if you came in the front doors of the main entrance of the Westin, we were the first room on the right. Okay. But now we we have moved to a larger room, and we're all the way at the back of that same floor in Chastain one and two, and it's behind the escalators. Okay. So the yeah, and one nice thing about that is that people can actually get there without having to go through the go through the main hallway they can come in from outside along the side of the westin come in on in the side doors to the fifth floor take the escalator up one floor and there we are awesome so yeah so they can avoid some of that i'm sure you guys have experienced that when you trying to walk <laughs> through the westin absolutely uh, crowds at dragon yeah. con no yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So that's cool. Very awesome. Well, um, definitely looking forward to that for people. Uh, obviously they want to check out the app and the, and the programming guide for all the, the, the information about what's going on with your track. And also if they want to reach you guys online, you guys have a pretty good Facebook group. I was looking around there. That's pretty awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. That is the best way actually to get information from us and people can find it just by putting in Dragon Con Urban Fantasy. And awesome. that's exactly how we come up on Facebook. And that is something uh, and that that is active all year long. I mean, it's more active right now, of course, but, sure. you know, but all year long, it's it's active. That's what I personally update i do have someone else that works with me on it but it's that's where the the you know that's the best way to get the the newest news i guess you could say the most up-to-date information about any kind of programming or announcements or whatever we do have a twitter account also and that is also linked on there and okay. i'm look and it's uh it's embarrassing that I have to look that up. Well, that's okay. Um, <laughs> we can put the, but, we can put those as show notes. Uh, so okay. we'll include both of those in the show notes, and uh, so that'll be great. So people can look for you online, and of course, look for you at the con. So we definitely appreciate your well, your time with us. Well, thank you so much, and we do have a party Friday night, so I hope all of all of you can come. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's in the that's in the Dragon Con events, uh, and we have a number of other things going on too. So, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, your interest in the track, and it's been great talking to you. Absolutely, Carol. Thanks so much.
Thank you. Bye-bye. And now joining us, we have fresh from the high fantasy track at Dragon Con, the director, Jennifer Liang. Jennifer, welcome to the station. Oh, thank you for having me. So the high fantasy track, tell us a little bit all about this track. Is it, it's, it's not new, but there's changes, right? Or is it brand new? Well, it is a brand new track. Um, it is a combination of some tr tracks that had existed previously, as well as some things that hadn't had tracks before, but really needed a more focused place for their programming. Um, you know, years ago, I was the Wheel of Time track programming director. Um, and so Wheel of Time is one of those high fantasy things that falls under this. Um, the Tolkien track is um, going away. So it's going to take um, the Tolkien programming. And we're also going to have A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, we're going to have the Shannara Chronicles, um, Game of Thrones, the TV show. Um, so anything that has elves and wizards and an orphan boy going on a quest. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that's pretty specific. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you cover... It's weird because it... it Go ahead. It feels like a, like a really specific thing for a track, but it's also like very broad. If you start thinking about all the things that um, use high fantasy tropes or um, uh, are inspired by high fantasy, like one of the things that we're not going to be able to do this year because I ran out of time on the schedule. Um, but I've told the Star Wars director that we're totally doing um, Star Wars is space wizards with laser swords, and we're totally claiming it as a thing for next year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. Well, the, yeah. And there is, you know, the Star Wars track. So they they pretty much have a little bit of that covered. But I guess we're, yeah, I mean, definitely we can see where there's an overview. Um, I know that mm -hmm. we've talked to a lot of other track directors. And yes, there's quite a bit of overlap. But that's the beauty of Dragon. Oh, yeah, definitely. You've got, you've got all these tracks that really are like 30 plus conventions all happening at the same time. So Mm -hmm. It's uh, it works out really cool. How long have you been involved with Dragon Con? When when was your first time when you went? Okay, so my first time going to Dragon Con was in 2000, and okay. I went with my then fiance, now husband, and my brother, and uh, we just got day passes and walked around for a couple of hours. And uh, as we were walking around, my husband was all like, "Hey, like this is really cool, but you know, like they're missing a track. You know what track they're missing?" They're missing a wheel of time track. You should totally email them and see if they'll let you do a wheel of time track. And at this point, like I had no experience with conventions. This was my very first time going to any kind of convention whatsoever. And I'd only been at Dragon Con for a couple of hours, but I totally emailed Dragon Con and said, Hey, I want to do a wheel of time track. And for some reason they said yes. Wow. And so I ran the wheel of time track for 12 years after that. Um, and then of course we, the wheel of time track went away because they were trying to consolidate tracks at that point. Uh, but yes, um, that first year of running the wheel of time track was definitely like a trial by fire. I had no clue what I was doing. I had some very forgiving people helping me out from dragon con senior staff. Um, everybody was very forgiving and totally cool with like any stupid thing I did. <laughs> okay. That's 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 helpful. Well, and we found that, you know, there's a real camaraderie between uh, track directors. There's a little bit of competition, mm -hmm. too, which is healthy, I think. Uh, but a real camaraderie, too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, OK, so so you did the Wheel of Time track. Um, so mm -hmm. was that your second year? Yes. Wow. So 2001 so is when the Wheel of Time track started. Wow. So your second year, boom, your track director, a new track, and uh -huh. the Wheel of Time track goes for, that one, That lasted uh, quite some time, right? Yeah, 12 years. Okay, that's, yeah, that's amazing. And, uh, um, and, then, and then where did you go? Uh, well, then I had a couple years off, and I just sort of was there at Dragon Con. Um, gotcha. I took one so you didn't year stop off going even though you didn't have a track? No, I didn't stop going. I took one year off just because I needed like a mental break. Like I needed a year where I was somewhere else that weekend. And so um, I went to Worldcon because it was the same weekend. So I was in San Antonio. Um, and then I came back and I did just a couple of years of kicking around Dragon Con and like looking at panels and hanging out in the art show because what else am I doing right now? Uh, and that was fun. And it was nice because I got to... Uh, do things on my own schedule, which you don't get to do as a track director. Um, but you know, I just, I was kind of bored sometimes. 
I get that. Although being bored at Dragon Con does not happen very often to me. I, I think you have to be a retired track director for it to happen. <laughs> I, I would imagine so. I would imagine so. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so then you got involved with now. Th so you got involved with which track then? Um, I did some panels for fantasy literature and for sci-fi literature. Okay. Um, but that was it. I wasn't okay. officially like volunteering or anything. Gotcha. Gotcha. And and so now there's uh, the high fantasy track. Um, mm -hmm. And so what exciting things you guys have coming up? We have a lot of really exciting things coming up. Um, we're going to be doing the evening at Brie party on Friday night. Um, that was a staple of the Tolkien track. And when I asked the Tolkien fans like, Hey, what will you be really mad if it goes away? Um, one of the things they all universally said was evening at Brie. We have to keep evening at Brie. Like this is what makes my dragon con. So we're keeping evening at Brie. We've got a really awesome party. We're going to have some live music. Uh, we're going to have a costume contest, uh, some games and some prizes and things like that. Okay. And then uh, we're going to do Hobbit drinking songs. That was another really popular thing from <laughs> the Tolkien track that they really wanted me to keep. Uh, so Hobbit drinking songs. Uh, we're going to sing some of the songs from the Lord of the Rings books. Um, it's going to be led by, and I can never say their name correctly. I'm going to have to apologize to them when I see them. Um, the Brobdignanian Bards. Um, they're very nice people. and They sing very wonderful things, and I can never pronounce the name of their band. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, that's that's epic. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we're going to be doing a late-night Game of Thrones panel called Looney Theories. Uh, where we're going to try to predict how either the books or the TV show will end uh, with the wackiest ideas we can come up with. Like if you've ever seen the Varys as a mermaid theory, uh, we're going to be coming up with stuff like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. That definitely sounds like something that should be reserved for the more of the late night crowd. Oh, it's definitely like you need to be a couple <laughs> drinks in to really appreciate this one. <laughs> <laughs> That was something we used to do at the Wheel of Time track was Looney Theories, and everybody loved it. But the Wheel of Time books are over, and we don't have a TV show. So I was like, hey, let's apply this Looney Theories idea to something else. Makes sense. Makes sense. And yes, of course, Game of Thrones. I mean, people, you can't help but like read those books or watch that show without trying to think of what's going to happen next. Mm hmm And some of it out there is pretty crazy. Oh, it's nuts. I'm I'm not kidding that there's a theory out there that Varys is secretly a mermaid, and that's how he's able to get between Essos and Westeros so quickly. <laughs> that would be the visual of that is very strange. Uh, uh, so, <laughs> uh, so just yeah, that that might haunt me now. Thank you. Um, yeah, yeah. Now now you're stuck with this. <laughs> Um, now, in addition to, um, uh, of course, a lot of fan discussion, do you also have, um, are you going to have guests stop by the track room? Like celebrities? Or? We do have, we do have some guests that are in the works right now. Um, we did have Lena Headley and like a couple hours before I got on the call with you, um, Lena Headley unfortunately had to cancel because of her yeah. filming schedule. I did see uh, that so news. She was, yeah, she was a guest that was confirmed for our track, um, but I'm not worried about that we don't have guests announced yet. I know that Dragon Con is working on some really great people. Um, I've seen the list of names that they're working on. I just can't say who they are, sure, but sure. I think people will be really pleased with the guests. Awesome, awesome. And you know what? I mean, really, I mean, that's always great, but the fan mm -hmm. panels are just as popular, if not more so than even the celebrity panels are at Dragon Con. I mean, it well, really just is from sheer for the habit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just from my habit, um, Wheel of Time track, I had one author that could be a guest for my track, and he only came to Dragon Con once. Um, I, I can put on an entire track of a lot with no celebrities whatsoever. Sure, sure. That's uh, something that we quite often find when we talk to track directors that, you know what, I mean, mm -hmm. they almost have to force fit the celebrity <laughs> panels in. I know. Like, it's almost like, really? I got to, like, scram Lena Headley in here somewhere? Like, oh, I guess I can shove her in here Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, with your personal experience or in your experience as a track director all those years, what are some of the big highlights that uh, you've experienced at Dragon Con over the years? So, my biggest year at Dragon Con was probably the year we had Robert Jordan come. 
Um, that was 2005, and he was the author of Guest of Honor for the convention that year. Um, and it was my second time meeting him in person. I'd met him at a book signing a few years before, um, but this was like the first time I'd really gotten to talk to him and interact with him. Um, and so that was really a big deal because I sort of like known him from afar through his work for so long. And his work had been very foundational to who I am as a person. Um, I met my husband through his books. I've met all of my really good friends through his books. Um, it's, it's not a fandom. It's a lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, so meeting Robert Jordan, getting to have dinner with him and getting to talk to his wife for a little while, that was a big year for me personally. Um, and everybody that, I, that was at that year at Dragon Con with me, it's like, oh yeah, like remember the year Robert Jordan came? That was so cool. Um, and there's a lot of things that came out of that year too. Like um, I ended up starting a um, fantasy literature con convention in honor of Robert Jordan. That's also here in Atlanta uh, because people who had attended Dragon Con for that first year, uh, that first time with uh, Robert Jordan there said, this is really nice, but wouldn't it be great if we had a con for just us? Right. And like a fool, I listened to them. So, you know, there's, <laughs> there's a Jordan con out there now. <laughs> That's how it starts. And then the other really big year for me at Dragon Con was, and this is more sad, um, it was 2008, uh, and that was the first Dragon Con after Jim had passed away, after Robert Jordan had passed away. Um, and that was the year that Brandon Sanderson came to Dragon Con for the first time because uh, he was the guy that was going to finish the Wheel of Time books. And uh, so he had to come out to Atlanta to meet us, <laughs> and we made him do that. And so <laughs> it was <laughs> um, it was a very different experience meeting Brandon than it was meeting Robert Jordan, because uh, Brandon is a much younger guy. He's my age. Um, you know, we both grew up reading the Wheel of Time books together, and so our our conversations were much more like peers talking about our favorite book series, and not so much like, oh, you wrote my favorite thing ever. Oh, is it okay if I touch you? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, it was really great meeting Brandon for the first time. And I remember um, talking to somebody about Brandon, like, and we're looking at him, we're like, this guy has no clue, does he? He has no idea what a rock star he's, he's about to be because he was like just in our track room, like hanging out, like listening to our trivia contest and like kind of giggling over some of the answers we had. And like one of my friends was like, is that Brandon Sanderson? I'm like, yeah, he's just hanging out. I don't know what to do with him. <laughs> and, you know, and, and now like, there's no way Brandon can walk anywhere without people being like, Oh, it's Brandon Sanderson. Let me show you my Miss Cloak or whatever, like cool Miss Bourne costume I have today. Um, so it was kind of cool to like get to meet Brandon before he became the Brandon Sanderson. Gotcha. Um, you got to, you got to became, say like, you knew him big... when. Yeah. And it was so fun. <laughs> That's very cool. That's uh, excellent. Excellent. Uh, and, um, so where are, where is your track room? So our track room is going to be in Marriott in room 401. Okay. That, and that's a that sounds like a pretty sizable room. It's pretty decent. I think we're going to be able to fit a lot of things in there. Um, yeah, there's there's I think it seats like 250 people, so we should be able to cram everybody in there. Awesome, awesome. And um, do you have uh, obviously no? Yeah, I know you do because I I've I've uh, looked and checked, and you guys have a, a Facebook group, and you've got a Facebook page and mm -hmm. all that, um, and a Twitter account too, or. No, I don't have a Twitter account for the track. Um, okay, gotcha. I use Twitter a lot for work. And so in, in my head, Twitter is a work thing, not a fun thing. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, but the, the Facebook group that I was looking at did uh, have uh, a lot of stuff on it. And definitely, would you say that's the place to go if to, to learn more about the track and what's going on? Yeah, if you do Facebook, that's a good place to go to um, ask us questions about the track, uh, to get up, up to the date um, updates. Um, I posted the track schedule there a couple days ago. It's you know, obviously a tentative schedule, um, but you can look at it and see like what's going on or what we're intending to happen. Um, and I post like little links that I find like that are high fantasy related and just things that are up for discussion. Um, we did a poll a few months ago to pick a book. And so we all the once in future King this summer. And so we're going to have a book club discussion of it at Dragon Con. Um, Very nice. We'll probably do that as like, oh, yeah, we'll probably do it as like literature circles because I'm a teacher and I have to turn everything into like an educational thing. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Um, 
And and yeah, like most of the track rooms that uh, the tracks at Dragon Con, thanks to Facebook and a presence there and with a group, now that's something where you have a community all year round. Mm-hmm. So that that works out really well. And uh, and of course, everybody and that's the beauty of it when the people. So when people come to Dragon Con, it's like a, a sort of a, an in, in-person reunion of everybody who's been, you know, hanging out, chatting in the, in the community all year round. Yeah, that's definitely what I've discovered. One of the reasons why we wanted to do a Wheel of Time track low those many years ago uh, is because me and my husband were very involved in a, a Robert Jordan fan forum. Uh, and we wanted a place to have a meet <laughs> so we can meet all the people we've been chatting with. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we're like, hey, let's make a track at Dragon Con. Then all of our friends will come and hang out with us. <laughs> yeah. And so you've it's sort of um, so, yeah, a lot of challenges, it sounds like. But um, it, it, with this first year of this being a track, but it sounds like you'll have no problem with, you know, getting getting fans interested because you've got really you know, like hot topics right now, especially Game of Thrones, which mm-hmm. is going on as we is it going to be is the season going to be over before dragon con because yeah that would be ideal right yeah the season will be completely done by the time dragon con is uh, here oh, just too uh, short so we'll do like a yeah it, it's a shorter <laughs> season um but they seem to be cramming it full of a lot of stuff for us so i'm like oh okay yeah so there'll be a lot to talk about um yeah. and 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 then of course you know with uh those folks moving over from the token track as well as uh all other you know fantasy um uh, yeah fantasy now there's still a literature fantasy track right that's separate yes there's still a fantasy literature track and that's run by charlotte moore okay. and uh they're focusing on things that are just written fantasy um gotcha. but not specifically high fantasy it's more of a broad overview like there's there's a lot of different kinds of fantasy. There's high fantasy, there's low fantasy, there's epic fantasy. Um, I can't even list them all out right now, but there's there's a lot <laughs> of different kinds of ways you can write about elves and wizards and orcs. Yeah. Uh, and so she covers everything that's not specifically high fantasy. Um, and she only does written works. Gotcha. Um, my track can do um, TV shows, movies, books. Um, we've talked about doing video games and board games at some point. Um, anything that incorporates those tropes of high fantasy. Oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, that's a, that, that should give you enough for four days for sure. So, oh, definitely. Uh, yeah. So we can't wait to see all the programming once that's announced. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we'll have a link to the Facebook group. So if people want to check out and ask questions, they can do that. Uh, and I guess, uh, you know, in a few, it's, yeah, in a few weeks from now, we'll, we'll see you at the con. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much for joining us. No, you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And we're done. And now joining us, we have with us, uh, right from the Skeptics track, a.k.a. the Skept track, Dragon Con, uh, it's the track director himself, Derek Colanduno. Derek, welcome to the station. Hey, how you doing? I'm just, how are you doing? You only got, like, what, three weeks left? Uh, Or less, yeah, busy. (laughs) (laughs) Especially, you know, because... Because we get down there a couple of days early to set everything up, so uh, actually I'm I'm lucky because the senior directors are down there for like almost a week before con starts. So, you know, I I'm I, I get the extra five days. <laughs> now, um, I, I, to be honest, I don't know a lot about the skeptics track, so this is all new to me. Um, very excited to have you on. Join us. Um, how long have you been a part of the skeptics track? Oh, we started the, I actually founded it. Okay. Um, So uh, from the beginning, uh, it was an offshoot, believe it or not, it was an offshoot of the podcasting track, which is the first track I was the director for. Um, And then me and my co-host, Robin McCarthy, um, we ran the podcasting track. And then after the first or second year of the podcasting track, I got so many skeptic guests for the convention, uh, for like the science and space track, I got a phone call from the the time the chairman was Pat Henry, and he called me and he said, "If I gave you a whole skeptic track, would you fill it?" I said, "No problem." Um, and then that was in 2000. Uh, that was the end of 2006's convention. So it was it 2007 we started the skeptic track? This is will be our 10th anniversary. Wow! Congratulations. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so 
now do you have a uh, affinity for obviously if you're the track director you must have uh, had an affinity for the subject matter of before this <laughs> well i am um, i'm the co-host host producer of skepticality which is the official audio program for skeptic magazine so i guess you could say that yeah i guess so <laughs> So let, let me ask you this: how, how would you how would you define a skeptic? Like a skeptic? Well, okay. Now, first off, you know the the colloquial term skeptic is a little different than the how skeptics view it themselves. Um, skeptics are usually the people who are fans slash cheerleaders of the scientific method and the skeptical inquiry of claims. Um, so things like, you know, alternative medicine, you know, the, the, the joke with skeptics is, well, you know what call, you know, you call alternative medicine that works. We call that medicine. <laughs> all right. So, you know, if it's all, it's alternative because it doesn't work yet. <laughs> right. You know, nobody's actually proven it works. Um, so, you know, so it's not that you're just doubt everything. Um, you would just doubt things until you actually are shown evidence or proof. Okay. Okay. So, and the skeptic movement, quote unquote, kind of grew out of um, uh, Jane Brandy and Carl Sagan and a couple other people back in, you know, the, the modern version of it um, back in the, you know, the late seventies, early mid late sixties, early seventies. Um, and it really is a, at the root, it's mainly a, a uh, was it consumer protection group, really, um, because there's a lot of public that nobody believes or they believe in things or they think things work that don't, and there are other there aren't government agencies that deal with that. So at the beginning, it was things like James Randi was James Randi's best friend was um, uh, Johnny Carson. So Johnny Carson was a big skeptic. He never told anybody because he didn't want to on the air. But if you go back and watch Johnny Carson, they many times where they like just did you know debunking of like crazy people like Pierre Popoff and. Uh, Johnny Carson, I remember when they, uh, James Randi came on the show and showed him how he was getting, quote unquote, his messages from God. And it was actually his wife in the audience who had information from people's wallets in the audience. You know, so they weren't messages from God. They were, you know, messages from his wife in a hearing aid he had that was deep ear. And they actually found a, a signal and they played the actual her telling him about the people that were standing there. Um, wow. And, you know, things like, you know, educating people on things that they think are scientific, like homeopathy, and you see that stuff and they think it's like alternative medicine. And if you actually learn about it, uh, it, it has no actual feasible way it could ever work. You can test it all you want, but it's just water. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you actually learn about how it works, it's, it's if you just do the math, the Avogadro's number. You mean there is there is a zero. Let's say that the the claim, which is on its face crazy to begin with, that if you want to cure something, you use the same thing to cure it. We have to dilute it, but the amount of dilution that you have to make to make a homeopathic treatment, if you actually do the math. The odds of you actually getting one molecule are impossible. Gotcha. So, so in this kind of discussion, this this is what you guys cover mostly, or what kind of you have, what kinds of you stuff like that. Um, a lot of things we really focus on the misunderstood elements of stuff that actually has scientific information behind it. So we're not quite the skeptic. I mean, the science track. We're okay. a kind of a kind of like an offshoot of it, but we kind of deal with the um, why things are either true or not true that people 
might believe or claim to believe, or they might be claim could believe, but they don't. Um, so we're kind of like the cheerleaders of science, but we're kind of an offshoot. Like we, we deal with uh, uh, people who have vaccine denial. Um, we've actually had the past couple of years, we've had a couple actual researchers on um, uh, transgender people. So they actually actually give you the actual science behind it. There is science there that people don't know about. Um, so things like that. It sounds very interesting and stuff. It sounds like, yeah, um, like really good programming. And uh, what kind of uh, have certain panels that are like pretty much things that you do, like big deals every year? Uh, yeah. So instead, considering that, you know, the two people, the couple people who created the skeptic movement, one of them is a, an illusionist, a magician, James Randi. Um, and Magic and illusion are a big deal in the skeptical because how magicians work. They they work based on brains are kind of I would say broken, but they have things that we we believe our brains are faulty. Magic works. You know, you can do things like make a coin to this this to, to be how brains perceive things. Um, so magicians are a big deal in the skeptic world. So we have and some panels about how in the missions work in there and their skeptical methods and how they, they in their magic shows, they show you some things that shows how the their magic actually works, which is kind of cool. Um, wow, that sounds very yeah. cool, actually. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's not they don't give away the trick, but they will <laughs> kind of, kind of be one of the like uh, one of one of the big back in the '80s is psychic surgery stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. Pull stuff out. Pull all that, which is just tricks. Um, and so like, like they kind of show you do it. I mean, have it. Look, I am. Um, not this is how this works it's a lot like stupid stuff you know like to just to prove that you know it can be done you know um yeah so, you know so we actually we have a we have a big magic show um usually on saturday or sunday night um and uh I'm sure we have um uh the ac ac america uh are doing a giant party um, one night over the Hyatt. Gotcha. Um, as part of the track. Yeah. So yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah. I was going to say, so is it just, yeah. Is there, yeah. Is there a theme to the party? Um, so just, a, just a reason to, 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 to get it and let loose. Right. So you've the, you got the big party. Yeah. Um, and then we have the magic show and, um, and there's a few workshops that, People that are guests on my track, they're doing which are these side things that can come or you remember it back gives you access to everything at the convention, other than workshops, um, which are an extra fee. But the workshops usually come with things and they're also more hands on and longer. So like a workshop would be like, you know, three or four hours, usually broken up in like a couple different days. Um, so there's they've been doing that for a long time at Dragon Con. I know that. Um, some of the guests that do like meditation workshops and things yes. like that have been going on for a while. Um, now, if someone wants to find out in depth of panels you guys are running, where is there, in addition to, of course, the app and, and, and all that, um, is you guys have a good Facebook group. So uh, is that everything, all the information posted there? Yeah, the stuff at the Facebook group or you can see the skeptic uh, award, okay. um, which is the website. Um, I have our tentative schedule. I posted it a few days ago. Um, so barring <laughs> the mentioned having to move things around, which happens. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, uh, people always complain about that. Well, how do they put things that I really want to see? They're always like against each other. I have to remind them, the convention has to do that on purpose. 
because usually those are the things that everybody wants us to see. So if they don't get each other, they're going to end up with you know, 78,000 people trying to go to one event. <laughs> and, that's, that's true. And, and the, the, the city was us down. So we actually on purpose put the really cool stuff <laughs> at the same exact time. So you have to choose. I know it's a pain, but it's for people's safety. <laughs> that's, you know what? I had never thought of it that way, but that makes yeah. perfect sense. Um, where, where are your track room? Uh, we're easy to find. If you're in the Marriott, go to the Sky Bridge that goes to the Hilton. Or on the Hilton side, right when you can come in the Hilton, if you're on the Sky Bridge, if you look to the right when you get into the Hilton, we're right there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we yes, will definitely look, find. Absolutely. And we will definitely look for you. Um, I hope I, I get to see you uh, on my travel at Titan Con. And I encourage everybody to check out your track as well. So we will post the uh, Facebook group link in our show notes so that people can check out. Cool. What? Yeah, thank you, Derek, for joining us. No problem at all. And now, last but certainly not least, uh, we have with us from SMP Designs, Sean Patton joining, the st- joining us on the station. Welcome, Sean. Hi, thanks for having me. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I definitely am excited to have you join us. Uh, the, the work that you do um, directly and indirectly for folks at Dragon Con, so a lot of people... I know a lot of people do know who you are, but I think a lot of people may not. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself and SMP Designs in particular. Uh, well, I started out in costume design in uh, in high school and then studied in college and uh, did a lot of work in opera and theater, um, uh, you know, for many, many years, uh, then worked for um, a supply house, a national supply house and ran their uh, costume design shop and uh, kind of got into doing some media stuff there, some TV commercials, things like that. And then also um, had a few, uh, a couple of people who were doing, you know, some, some of the cosplay stuff kind of in the, in the early days back in like 99, 2000 sure. come in. And um, I, I kind of fell into it from there and it's all just kind of snowballed. Uh, <laughs> it's all just kind of snowballed from there. So now I, I've moved away from, doing theater and things like that. And, uh, I'm, I do a lot of commission work for, um, for collectors. And then I do a lot of work for, you know, agency, um, agency and media type things for uh, corporate it, clients and that kind of stuff. And this is really cool. I mean, you're actually a, you know, a lot of people do this as a, a, a hobby, but you've actually, I mean, this is, you are a professional, uh, costume and, uh, and designer, right? Yeah. What the hell was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty, it, it's been pretty cool. And, and now, um, uh, are, do you, do you find yourself, um, sort of, um, sort of favoring, cause you're asked to do a design a lot and a lot of the, the designs that you've had and you've done has been sort of geek oriented. Um, does that sort of culture one that you're familiar with as well? Oh yeah. I mean, I've been, uh, yeah, ever since I was growing up, I mean, we've comes from, you know, my parents and, and, um, you know, my, my entire life growing up, I was always watching, uh, you know, early days of anime in the eighties. And, you know, my parents were big, like Stephen King and fantasy fans and that kind of thing. And so it's kind of, I've, I've grown up around it. Um, gotcha. my dad was a commercial artist and I remember, you know, growing up, hanging out in his studio, flipping through all of his, you know, um, Frazetta books and, and, um, you know, Vallejo books and Picasso and, you know, everything from fine art to fantasy art to, to you know, the, the pointillists and the, the cubists and everything. So it's I've had a, a wide range of uh, of uh, experience uh, in, now, in art and media. <laughs> are there certain challenges when someone asks you or when you're designing a costume um, is uh, I mean, obviously there's a, a lot of, I'm sure there's a lot that goes on it, but is there a certain challenge to making something uh, specifically practical for a convention experience like Dragon Con? Um, well, there are challenges in making things practical so that they can exist in real space. You know, I, I I guess a lot of times I'm doing a lot of things that are coming from like, um, you know, the cinematic universes and things like that. So you've already got pretty much a basis in reality, even though, you know, the magic of film, a lot of the things that you're seeing there are are really heavily reconstructed and, you know, and after effects and post-production and that kind of thing. But 
um, when you're talking about doing something that's right off the page or that somebody sends you like comic art and goes, you know, I want to do this and you're dealing with, okay, well, how do you get in and out of it? Like some things, especially, you know, for the ladies defy the laws of physics, <laughs> if you follow me. <laughs> yep. So you, you kind of have to figure out how to bring something into real space. So that can be somewhat challenging. And then, you know, you get people too, who will want things for Dragon Con who are like, Oh, I want to be, you know, like, um, you know, uh, nice watch person, or I want to be, you know, in this, you know, giant armored, you know, Captain America thing, but I don't want to be hot. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Guess what? You're going to be, so, you know, you carry some paper towels around cause you're going to be sweating like crazy. <laughs> right. So, um, I think there, you know, there are, those are where you kind of get, um, more hung up as far as practicality for just being there. Um, I've not really done anything on the kind of scale on the kind of like gigantic fabrication scale that, that really takes a whole lot of, um, uh, consideration for, for that kind of thing. Um, I do more, you know, things that are, that are, um, more wearable, I guess is the only way to put it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, as far as your own experience with Dragon Con, when, when was your first, uh, when was your first Dragon Con? Um, my first Dragon Con, I think was 98. Okay. So and, very, very um, nice. Yeah. And I've not missed a year since then, if you very it or nice. not. So were you, yeah, were this will you... be my 19th year. Yeah. This will Ooh, be my 19th okay. one. So were yeah, you, were you crazy. dressing up from the beginning? No, no, not really. Um, I, I didn't, you know, we would kind of go and just sort of hang out and, and, um, actually spend a lot of time in the gaming room, um, you know, doing, you know, card games and, and, you know, board games and stuff like that. And then also doing a lot of the film stuff and, you know, kind of the late night, you know, um, uh, um, anime, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Festivals and that kind of thing. Sure. So I didn't really get into it till probably until around 2000, 2001, I started kind of getting into it. Okay. And then it sort of snowballed out where I started making a bunch of stuff for other people. And then I started making things for myself. And so, you know, I, I do a lot of projects, you know, for other people who are running around and then. I'll do like, you know, maybe one or one thing for myself each year. And then that's pretty much it. Gotcha. One new thing, or do you, do you, do you find you, you just, do you dress up just once or do you just have one new costume a year for yourself? I'll have one new, I'll have one new. So I'll have three things that I'm sure um, at this point. And then um, two of them are pieces that will go with the person who's coming with me. And then um, the other one will be going with someone else who's already going to be there. So all three of the things I'm bringing are going to be pairs, one part of a pair. Um, but every once in a while, I'll do things to film just because, uh, you know, just because I think it's cool or, or I want to. But now, you know, since I go with uh, one of my best friends, you know, it's, it's always kind of fun for us to have things that go together. I, I'll tell you what, uh, I've been going since 94, but it was pretty apparent to me right from the beginning that Dragon Con was a costuming con. Um, very early on, uh, I would see costumes that like I would never see at at other other conventions. I mean, sure, if I went to a Star Trek uh, centered convention, there would be people in uniforms and everything. But to the extent that Dragon Con always has this history of of intense um, and elaborate. Uh, costuming is just, I think, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's other places around the world that are, that uh, are comparable, but man, for Dra- for a while, Dragon Con was at the forefront of that, I think. Yeah, I mean, it really is. I mean, you know, I've got a lot of friends who go out to, to um, San Diego and do New York and that kind of thing. But, um, and those are, you know, those are really great, but um, uh, it's, um, you know, everybody always says like, you know, in the U.S., like Dragon Con is the like is the like costume convention. Um, you know, it, it's where people just really bring like bring their A game. Um, and I mean, people come from all over the world to do it. I mean, it just so happens that there's a huge you know community here in Atlanta. But I mean, there are people who come from from everywhere for this, and it's uh, it's pretty amazing. So in addition to the couple that you're doing for yourself, uh, can you give us an idea on like how many other uh, costumes or, or designs that you're working on or that are going to be yours for this year for other people? 
Um, this year, I'm keeping it pretty light this year because I've got okay. a lot of other projects. I've got a lot of other projects going on. So I'm kind of keeping the Dragon Con stuff a little bit on the light side. And I've, I've been having to travel a lot too lately. So, um, you know, that, that takes a giant chunk of time out of what I'm sure. able to, to do. But I've got about, I mean, I've got about four. Uh, about four good projects going on this year. Um, there's a, a Stardust um, project. I've got um, a Nightwing going on. Um, I'm working on um, one of the ones that I'm doing with my friend. We're doing um, Captain America and Red Skull. And then um, uh, let's see, what are some of the other ones? Um, I know I'm forgetting one or two of a few things going on. Nothing nothing really crazy overly complicated so i'm not quite you know pulling my hair out yet <laughs> yeah. but uh but it's um but it's good yeah there's there's gonna be some fun stuff i mean i've had years where i, I had like nine nine or ten projects for dragon con and it just was you know it was just bed around here right. yeah sure. it was really it was just bananas and i'm like i can't i'm getting too old for that i can't <laughs> i can't do that <laughs> i've got to I got to spread it out a little bit. <laughs> uh, let me ask you, is there one or a couple of different costumes in mind that were particularly challenging that you're, you know, you, 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 you look at and you go, man, that was, that was something. Um, there have been a few that have posed their, you know, their unique challenges. Um, I think uh, I did a King Loki. Yes, it was two years ago. And that one was just interesting just to figure out. Um, you know, uh, I, I did the armor and all that kind of stuff. So I, I was kind of working in, um, you know, Warbler for the second time and, um, you know, really sort of trying to learn some new techniques and things like that. I mean, I come from a like a tailoring background. So fabrication to me is still fairly new. So it's always sort of an interesting um you know, interesting time when I'm diving into something that's got like armor pieces or I'm like pouring molds or casting things, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, so anything that involves that kind of thing, yeah, it tends to be kind of a challenge. Um, also, uh, you know, anytime somebody comes up and says, you know, I want something that I want, like kind of like a mashup or a conceptualized version of it. Um, you know, that's, that's always interesting. I, I mean, in a fun way, that's challenging because you get to kind of take something that that's already out there and go, okay, now how do we want to build on top of this? You know, how do we want to make this, you know, just extra awesome and, and, um, and, and drive some more detail and some more dimension and some more depth into it. I did that with a Wolverine that I did um, just a, a few months ago. And I mean, I was really happy. The client was really happy with it. It turned out really great. Um, you know, and that one was interesting too, because the guy, I mean, well, he's Wolverine, you know, he's, playing Wolverine but he's, he's huge I mean he's just like this massive dude and he lives um and he's not local so you know I'm like trying to do mock-ups and build mock-ups and send off to him for fitting and make sure that we've got you know all the proportions right for you know for him I mean his arms are like the size of my legs it's crazy I mean so that you know so that that's always interesting too is just you know um someone who's not like a, a standard fit size or not a fit size of one of my forms mm -hmm. um puzzling out exactly how to get that fit just right so that it works for them and also make it movable. Um, you know, that can be, that can be a, a fun challenge as well. Absolutely. And uh, of course, looking at, and I definitely, we're going to have a link to this uh, um, for sure, but uh, your favorite, Facebook page has uh, a lot of the, the the custom work that you've done, and you've done a lot of work with a good friend of the station, uh, Riddle, on a lot of her uh, mo uh, her now considered iconic outfits. I have, yeah. She's actually one of the first one of the first people I started working with in this. Uh, I don't know, do we call it industry or what? What do we? Call <laughs> I think it? I think we do now. Yeah. But she and she and Yaya actually were the first two people that I started working with in all of this. And it's funny because I'll, you know, I'll, um, I'll see them or I'll see, um, I'll see Yaya and Brian and, and we'll kind of just kind of look around and go, she, how did, how did this happen? Like, where did this come from? Like, do you remember <laughs> when we were like hanging out at the shop going, oh man, we should like make this and do blah, blah, blah. And now it's now with everything that all of us are doing, I mean, I mean, they've got, um, you know, patterns and fabric lines and stuff. And, you know, we're all, you know, working in, you know, film and television. And, you know, I'm kind of I'm still doing, you know, private commissions. And it's just it's sort of bananas 
how it's really become its own kind of cottage industry. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I've, I've worked with worked with her on a lot of stuff. We did uh, Black Cat, we did Rocketeer, we did Mary Marvel, we did um, a couple of anime characters, and uh, you know, little bits and pieces of a lot of different things. I uh, and they've actually they've actually done a lot of stuff for me too. You know, they've helped me out with some of the early pieces that I needed cast pieces with. Um, you know, they would help me with some molding and casting stuff. So. Um, it really has been a very collaborative um, effort, and it's a very, uh, you know, it's very community oriented, uh, as far as as far as we're all concerned. Yes, that's good to hear. That's good to hear, especially still uh, uh, with you know with it with it being more of a of an industry now and a profession for a lot of people. It's good that it still has that camaraderie to it aspect to it. Yeah, definitely. I I think that if it if it ever became not that way for me, I would probably I would probably leave it. Um, you know, it's, um, it's something that I do that I enjoy. And if, if I get to the point where I don't enjoy it anymore, then I'll have to go in a different direction. Now, uh, you've already mentioned that, uh, one of the costumes that you've got going on for this year for yourself <laughs> will be, uh, Captain America. Is that the same one that, uh, I, we saw, I saw you, I was a, a table neighbor at a convention event with you and, uh, there was that amazing uh captain america uh costume that you were that you were showing off is that the same one it is that is the same one it was in it was in progress when you saw it there but it um it is the same one i debuted it at heroes con in charlotte uh back in june and um it went over really well it's great it's, it's on the folio on the site and all that kind of stuff and um so now i'm working on a concept version of red skull to go with it so Red Skull will be debuting at Dragon Con along with uh, Cap. And, gotcha. um, and my my buddy Chris, who's coming down and going to the convention with me, will be sporting Cap. And then I will be doing um, the new Red Skull. Oh, OK. So you're switching it up. Yeah. Yeah. Because he really wants to wear Cap. And I was like, OK, that's fine. <laughs> I've worn it once. <laughs> I was gonna say it looks like Cap is a is a theme with your uh, your your costuming, and I'm wondering if that's a, a if that's a um, character that's uh, got a special place for you because it seems like you've done I, a, a few with Cap. Yeah, yeah, I have. I've done a couple. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, Cap Cap is by far one of my favorite characters. I've I've always been a big Cap fan, and um, and uh, so I, I of course you know get like really excited uh, about doing some of those costumes. But I've done so many of them. I'm kind of like, if I ever see like navy blue cordura again, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna have an aneurysm. <laughs> but, but it's uh, nah, it's still one of my favorite characters. And there, there's so many different versions and so much you can do with with the character. Um, it's a lot of fun. I don't think that I don't think that that character will ever be boring for me, um, gotcha. even after the hundredth one. <laughs> God forbid. Now, uh, you mentioned that there were, were going to be two others for yourself. Um, can you give us hints of what those might be? Uh, they're not new, but okay. um, gotcha. we're going to do um, uh, my friend Chris, who I was talking about earlier, who's coming down. We did an Edward Kenway for him um, a couple of years ago, and that one is going to be going um, to D.C. with us. And um, I have just kind of like a um, just kind of like a. a pirate character that sort of goes with it's just a companion piece to that so we'll be doing kenway which had some upgrades done to it this past year and then the other one is uh my friend mj and i will be doing Circe and little finger oh um, very nice this year which which we did that one a couple of years ago too so we'll be doing we'll be doing uh those this year. Gotcha. Very awesome. Very so, awesome. So that's what I'm planning. <laughs> yeah, very good. Very good. And uh, hope to now do you um, are you planning to do any events particular? You don't do you have a, a table or a booth at Dragon Con this year or? No, I don't do a table or anything like that. Okay. I, I thought about it, but I would have to man it, sit there and man it the whole time. And I, I don't really want to do that. I like being able to run around. I mean, Dragon Con for me, it's like it's the crazy push to get to get there. And then once you're there, I'm like, I'm not making any plans. <laughs> it is like all bets are off i'm like i'm just here to have fun and relax and chill out and see friends and run around and drink and you know eat all the crap food that i've not let myself have for months and <laughs> you know all that kind of thing so uh so no i, I don't tend to do a, a whole lot of planned out things for it um obviously i well i mean i'll be doing panels 
but I, um, I, I go in as an attending professional, so I'll be. Gotcha. So you'll be doing some panels for the costume track? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Give me my schedule, but uh, but that's really the only kind of uh, agenda type thing that I do there. Awesome. So well, the people can definitely look for you on the schedule then and, and find out uh, uh, if they want to see you at uh, Dragon Con, they can look for you there. Also, uh, oh. I definitely recommend people check out their, uh, that your web page, uh, your Facebook page. Do you have uh, any other links or anything else that you want to just uh, prop up, uh, promote? Um, I, everything pretty much links through, through Facebook. Um, I've got several of my collaborators that I've got on my like pages. So check out my like pages for some of the people who do some like really amazing work. Um, and, um, you can follow me there through the site and Instagram and all that other kind of good social interwebby stuff. (laughs) Well, awesome. Well, thanks again for, for joining us and, and sharing some of that information and sharing sharing your work because it's been like yeah just looking at your designs i i, I had no idea that uh, you were involved with so many of the designs that i've seen uh and and really admired over the years so uh very impressive cool well thank you very much it was a pleasure to be here absolutely absolutely <laughs> And so we draw close to another episode of the 2017 Dragon Con Con Report. A big thanks to everyone for joining us on this episode. We are extremely honored to have chat uh, with Dan Carroll, Carol Malcolm, Jennifer Liang, Derek Colanduno, I believe I pronounced that right, uh, and Sean Patton from SMP Designs. Take another Please shot, folks. Out- I know, right? Please, <laughs> please check out the show notes uh, where there's links to all those folks and their track uh, websites and their uh, their Facebook pages and and check them all out. Uh, visit them all online because uh, that's uh, that's uh, how they get uh, a lot of uh, feedback. So, and we want feedback too. But more about that in a little bit. I also want to thank our station crew for tonight. Thank you, Eternal Zan. Welcome to the station. Thanks, you did a great job. Thank you very much. I loved it. It was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you, Darren. Oh, you're welcome. Anytime, gentlemen. And of course, thank you, Director Faber, for which none of this would be possible. Hey, I'm just the guy who pays the bills and hits record. (laughs) And you do it so well. Uh, We try to cover all we can with these specials, but to keep up with the latest news, please check out the official DragonCon website and their social media outlets, especially their Facebook page. All the tracks, as I mentioned before, have are active um, on Facebook and various other social medias as well. You can check out the ones that we talked to with the links in the show notes, and almost everybody else has one as well. So uh, be involved. Be involved with DragonCon and check out all the, uh, the things that the tracks have going on on their Facebook groups. Uh, as far as us here on the podcast, we can be found on Facebook as well. Twitter, Google+, even Stitcher. Uh, We want you to be part of the station. We want you to be part of the discussion. We want you to be part of Dragon Con. So we want to hear uh, your participation in Dragon Con, what you're looking forward to. Give us a call, 404-963-9057. Leave us a message. Tell us what you're you're excited about. Even if you've got an event or something you want to promote, Call us, and we will play that so that people know about your parties, know about your panels, know about what you're doing at Dragon Con, because uh, it's a big, big, big event. So uh, if we can help give uh, a little attention to your to your event, uh, to your panel, we would be more than happy to do so. So uh, please reach out to us. Um, you can also send us an email at uh, ESOPodcast at gmail.com, and we will read those. Or if you send us a voice message that way, uh, record something, shoot it in the email, we will play it on the next show as well. Um, and also help support us by clicking on the Amazon link at the top of the ESO homepage, filling up your cart with all sorts of geeky merchandise. Remember, it doesn't cost you any more, and it really does help us out a lot. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Mike Gordon, and it has been my pleasure. We'll see you at the con. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. 
Classic, current, and beyond. Be part of the crew at esonetwork.com. <laughs>